Good afternoon to those who are watching this live program from India and good morning to those who are watching it from the United Kingdom. Welcome all of you to live program number 156 at Orthopedic Principal. We are back with our amazing faculty, Professor Bijendra Singh from Kent, United Kingdom. If you've noticed, Prof Singh has lectured with us many times and they all were wonderful lectures and well engaging and viewed and shared by many people across the world. Dr. Singh is also a visiting professor at the Canterbury Christchurch University, and he's also the current president for the British Indian Orthopedic Society, or the BIOS UK. So today, it's my great honor to bring back Professor Vijayendra Singh for this wonderful live program on scapular fractures. Over to you, Prof. Uh, thank you, Hitesh. Uh, thanks for a kind uh, introduction. It's uh, good to be back uh, as per normal. Um, I do enjoy these sessions um, and I hope I can share some of my experiences and my learning with um, everyone else. Uh, today's talk is on scapular fractures. It's not something that we see very regularly or certainly that comes on our operating table uh, to um, do it. Even as an upper limb surgeon um, in a district general hospital, one would see it less, but the principles are the same. As you will see, um, this is a uncommon injury, and I'll take you through various aspects of um, assessing and managing uh, scapular fractures. There's no disclosures related to this topic. What I'm hoping to do is talk about the basic anatomy, mechanism of injuries, what to look out for, relevant classification uh, for these injuries, which will help make a management plan. So scapular fractures is not new. They've been described uh, previously with, um, uh, by a French surgeon, uh, PJ Dissault, in nearly or more than 200 years ago um, uh, in the treaties of fractures and luxations. Just to look at the um, uh, anatomy, so both from the front and uh, from the back, uh, what we can see is, um, is a well-protected uh, structures, um, the scapula, both in the front and the back. And what that means is that um, to get a fracture of the scapula or any part of the scapula, there has to be a significant uh, energy uh, to cause this. Uh, and what that means is that if there is a scapular fracture, then one has to look out for an other associated injuries. It's very uncommon to have uh, scapular fractures um, in isolation. Uh, so that's the key thing uh, about these injuries. We'll talk about the muscles and the other structures in a second. So if we look at both the front and the um, back, it's surrounded by um, what's part of the rotator cuff muscles, the subscapularis uh, at the front, and the supraspinatus at the top, and intraspinator and teres minor, uh, posteriorly and inferiorly. Um, and these are relevant, especially when we come to um, the surgical exposure to uh, access the scapula and the glenoid. It's got rich neurovascular supply, and these do make some of the um, approaches quite tricky. If we look at the picture on the left, this is the anterior uh, dissection for um, the uh, scapula, uh, which shows uh, the conjoint tendon to have been cut out to allow a uh, look at the deeper structures. And just behind the conjoint tendon, um, I can't find the mouse behind the conjoint tendon uh, would be your um, uh, brachial plexus that forms the cord. So it's already turned into cords at that level, um, which would be a structure at risk, especially with the coracoid uh, injuries or the front of the glenoid, anterior edge of the glenoid injuries. And when as accessing the glenoid from the front, uh, the axillary nerve and the circumflex vessels are at risk. And if we look at the posterior aspect of the <clears throat> approaches, it's even more trickier uh, 
um, especially as we go uh, more me uh, more lateral uh, towards the neck of the scapula uh, where the inferior circumflex vessels uh, as well as the axillary uh, neurovascular bundle comes uh, from the triangular and the quadrangular space and the suprascapular nerve as it passes along the notch behind the spine of the scapula so these are the main neurovascular bundles that need to be taken care of. I mean, there are other small uh, nerves that may be sacrificed uh, when accessing the um, fracture. So looking at the bony anatomy, the scapula is formed from, has got four different parts. Um, the coracoid process uh, arises from a separate um, ossification, the acromion, the spine of the scapula, the glenoid, as well as the scapular body. Um, what makes tricky the scapular body itself is that it's a flat bone and it's one of the only bones that does not have a direct connection to the axial um, uh, skeleton. It's kind of a large bone that is hanging amongst the um, uh, muscles and supported by the muscles uh, to be attached to the uh, body. Uh, the other thing to remember is the uh, orientation of the scapula uh, on the lateral view as it bends slightly um, towards the lower end of the, uh, the lower end of the scapula. And as you can see, it's quite thin. Um, and what you can see on the profile on the uh, middle uh, picture is that the thickness, that thickness is actually of the lateral border. The body itself is very thin. So any fixation on that is not a good hole. So if when coming to fixation, one should aim to get on the edges of the um, uh, edges of the uh, scapula, i.e. on the medial border or the lateral border, all along the spine or on the glenoid neck to get a meaningful fixation on this. Uh, the ligamentous structures that are useful and come into play, uh, the coracoclavicular ligament, uh, both the conoid and the trapezoid, uh, the AC joint ligaments, the superior and the inferior ones, uh, the coracoid chromial ligament, uh, the coracoid itself, uh, which in fact forms part of the suspensory system. Uh, which I will talk about um, a bit later on in the lecture. So the usual mechanism of injury is a fall from height or road traffic collision. Uh, it can happen due to muscular pull, uh, to swing or hanging into the electric shock and epilepsy. These are usually uh, lesser uh, injuries, i.e. more of an avulsion type of injury. And of course, you can get a secondary impaction injury due to um, the humeral head hitting against, the, impacting against the glenoid. But generally, what tends to happen is the humeral head suffers uh, before anything happens to the um, glenoid because the uh, humeral head bone is more, is relatively softer compared to the glenoid which makes it more liable to break before the glenoid uh, breaks. We look at the mechanism of injury, so you could fall from a height and landing on the shoulder can give rise to various injuries. And as you can see, this chap on the left, that, that shows how he's fallen and associated injuries can go, uh, including the head injury or the brachial plexus injury or even the spine injury. The ski injury uh, is one of the common ones, especially we see in this part of the world. Um, although UK is not, doesn't have many sports, but patients do travel back from their injuries and we see them in our patient. Or of course, sports injury, especially rugby or um, uh, football or the American football uh, is likely to cause these kind of injuries. With road traffic collision, it's usually more serious. So what do we know about this? It's an uncommon injury. As I said, it's to cause a fracture of the scapula, it does require a fairly high energy. And thankfully the associated mortality with these injuries are less 
can cause lung and solid organ injury as well as head injuries. What about the fracture itself? It accounts for less than 1% of all the fractures and about 3 to 5% of the shoulder girdle fractures. Half of them involve the body and the spine of the scapula and about a third um, involve this uh, glenoid. And the most important part is that it has associated injuries in more than 80%. So the, this is the thing that one needs to look at when um, looking for associated injury. So they've been classed into two broad groups, um, the orthopedic injuries, um, so rib fractures in more than half of them, ipsilateral clavicle fractures in the 25%, and this would cause the uh, disruption of the suspensory structures around the shoulder. Uh, spinal injuries in about a third, and brachial plexus in a small percentage. Associated other injuries include uh, lung injuries, pneumothorax in about a third, and uh, pulmonary contusion is about 40%. Head injury of varieties in third, a third of that, and vascular injury in about 10%. Evaluation of these patients has to be done on a ATLS principles, um, looking especially for any other injuries associated. A radiologic assessment includes a plain uh, AP radiographs as well as scapular Y view and axillary lateral view. A CT scan is useful to look for intraarticular fractures, any significant displacement. And a 3D is useful for um, any preoperative uh, planning for surgery. Just take you through a few uh, important relevant steps um, in assessing these uh, on plane radiographs and CT. So one of the terms that you may come across is the glenopolar angle. And this is the angle intent between the lateral edge of the scapula, so from the inferior tip of the uh, scapula to the top of the glenoid, that line, and then a vertical line dropped from the top of the glenoid tubercle. Uh, that angle of tendon is between 30 and 45 degrees is considered as normal. The, any outside of that variation um, may need, one may need to look at um, other aspects to assess if the patient may benefit from surgery. The other uh, um, alignment uh, measures is the lateral border offset. This is often better seen on um, an X-ray. So looking at the ratio of A to B, and if the difference is more than 20 millimeters, then may need to consider surgery. Uh, to better stabilize the glenopolar angle. Another way of looking, we can do it on a CT as well if the plane radiographs are not adequate. Angulation of more than 45 degrees. And I think for this one, you really need a CT scan uh, in that particular plane. And if you can ask your um, radiology department to uh, do a subtraction, images uh, wherein they remove the humeral head, uh, then it makes it uh, a bit easy uh, to assess that. Um, sometimes not just one factor is required, so a combination of displacement more than 15 millimeters and an angulation of 30 degrees uh, is suggestive, especially in a young active patient to consider fixation as they will have a better rehab and better pain control. And then there is the, which I will come to a bit later, is the double disruption of the uh, shoulder suspensory complex. The scapula fracture more than 10 millimeter displaced and the clavicular associated with the clavicular fracture or an AC joint disruption means it's what was also classed as a floating shoulder type of an injury where uh, one must have low threshold to stabilize, if not both, at least one of the injuries uh, to provide better pain relief, if nothing else. 
So classification, as you know, there's lots of classification uh, on everywhere. Uh, so what I'm aiming to do is look at the classification as well as talk about the management as we go along. So as we said in the preliminary, the, um, the body of the scapula is affected in about 50% of the injuries. The uh, glenoid neck uh, is affected in about 25 to 30% of them. Now, in vast majority of the patients, non-operative treatment is what is required in probably about 90% or more. Um, and the usual advice is sling for two weeks as pain allows, followed by early mobilization uh, under supervision. And generally, because of a good muscle bulk, uh, the fractures do align and they have a good uh, blood supplies. And patients can expect good functional outcomes. So the operative treatment uh, the indications are as, so if there is more than 25% glenoid, then this is likely to cause subluxation, uh, either chronic or acute, um, especially if it's involved the anterior aspect of the glenoid. If it's posterior, then more likely that they will heal and cause early degenerative changes. If there is a significant step in the glenoid fracture uh, or then one may consider surgery, excessive medialization of the glenoid, and any associated instability of the glenohumeral joint. So you can see all of them kind of go um, along with each other. Extraarticular fractures, uh, more than 40 degrees angulation of the body, uh, 1.5 centimeter translation uh, of the scapular body and the glenopolar angle less than 45 degrees. It's unusual to find an increased um, angle. It doesn't go away. The, the fracture doesn't tend to go on the other side. And also the scapular suspensory systems complex um, disruption, which again, as I've been telling, I'll come to you in a second. What this causes is a floating shoulder. So what that means is that the glenoid part is um, not supported and although the fracture may heal, uh, it's likely to cause severe pain for the patient. If there's an open fracture, which is again, very rare. Um, and if there is an open fracture, then the patient is likely to have other severe injuries, which may need addressing. So going through the fractures individually, uh, the coracoid fracture, there's two types, type one, is where it's um, practice at the base. Um, so the whole structure and may also take part of the um, uh, part of the glenoid along superior glenoid with it and has the attachment of the coracoclavicular ligament. And these are generally stable unless the glenoid uh, part is significantly bigger. Um, if it's the tip or the type two injuries, then these could be left alone. Uh, but one must remember that the um, musculocutaneous nerve um, does run quite close to the um, coracoid process and any fixation uh, is likely to irritate this nerve. One decides to fix it uh, for the tip, you can use um, either a cannulated screw like so, or one may use a bone anchor uh, that is inserted into the base of the glenoid and then sutures pass through the uh, tip of the coracoid process. If it's the basal fracture, then one can again fix it with a cannulated cancellous screw. But here one must be careful about not catching the suprascapular nerve whilst doing the fixation. The acromion uh, fractures, the Kuhn's classification is the one that is. Um, most commonly used. Type 1A is the avulsion type of injury, uh, which doesn't need doing anything. Type 1B is where there is the fracture of the acromion and the spine, but this is undisplaced. In type 2, um, there is some displacement, and the key in the acromial fractures 
is uh, whether it's going to encroach upon the subscapular space. And so that means two things. One, that it's got forces that is pulling away from the uh, other end, which means that the fracture is less likely to heal. And secondarily, um, it can cause an impingement type of a problem later on. So you could end up with an impingement and an ununited acromial fractures. So how do we go around fixing these? If you've made the decision, um, need to reduce it, and then you can either use a couple of cannulated screws or a tension band wire with K wires or a tension band wire uh, with the screws. Now remember the, uh, the acromion is a curve and a flat bone. So to try to get uh, the screws um, in the right plane without breaching the superior or the inferior cortex of the acromion can be tricky. And on table um, assessment of the um, breach with imaging is very difficult. So one should not take these um, lightly and take extra care that you don't breach uh, the cortices. So type three is the one that where there is significant displacement and this causes encroachment in the subscapular space. And this could be with or without the scapula, uh, so the glenoid fractures. In that, if there's a glenoid fracture, then that is almost um, an indication to fix both these injuries. So how do we do it? Can do it um, in a bead chair um, or lateral position. The advantage with the bead chair is that uh, you probably need one less assistant uh, and it uh, provides better um, access to the imaging facilities that you will require. It may, you may have run into problems if as long as there's only the acromial fractures, it's fine, but if one has to access the glenoid neck, then that uh, beta position precludes uh, that. And also the anesthetist may not be your friend uh, if something goes wrong. The lateral position has the advantage that you can move it around. Yes, you can do an arthroscopic assessment as well, but I would stay away from that, uh, especially in acute situation. Uh, you'll be able to access the whole of the glenoid um, and the scapula if required. And it just makes imaging is quite difficult um, in this position, even for simple injuries. So the approaches that one can use is the superior approach, um, uh, where uh, the, the incision is along the line of the scapular spine, and you lift off the generally form a plane uh, between the supra and infraspinatus. This is mainly for the acromial fracture fixation and it's quite an easy approach. You can use a saber cut incision uh, following the same principles um, and this will allow access to the acromion uh, and the AC joint and you could extend it anteriorly if one were to access the glenoid as well. Moving on to the fractures of the scapula, uh, it, just the classification, it can be um, isolated or multifragmentary. The fractures of this process individually, the spine, the coracoid, or the acromion, which is classed as B1, B2, B3. And then the fractures of the scapular neck, the anatomical neck, the surgical neck, and then surgical neck with the clavicle and acromion and torn uh, coracoclavicular and the CA ligament. Then we go on to the articular fractures, which is the D group, can be a glenoid rim, both the anterior and the posterior glenoid rims, and then various combination of uh, the horizontal split and the coracoglenoid block fractures. Uh, as well, going to the scapular neck and body fractures, and then finally a combination of any any of these. Just showing an example of a patient uh, who had this injury, and you can see uh, that here there's been use of two approaches to access the uh, 
scapula and the patient's done well. The chap who was involved in a road traffic collision and um, along with the um, scapular injuries, he also had head injury and spinal injuries. And he came to have this fixed about 10 days uh, down the line. One must remember that although optimally you want to do them fairly um, soon because it's a cancerous bone um, and the thinness of the bone makes it quite tricky if there's a delay, um, but often the other injuries uh, trick precedence over this uh, glenoid or the scapular injuries. And often the patients are uh, done at two weeks time unless uh, one is in a, multi, um, in a major trauma center where um, these can be fixed early on with other injuries as well. These days you can use uh, specialist anatomic plates and I would certainly recommend these, um, but if not, uh, the 2.4, 2.7 millimeter plate and screws that are often used on the um, distal radius and the um, forearm set, it comes in quite handy uh, as they're easy to use and, and occupy less space. What about the glenoid fractures? Um, so these are classified according to the Eidelberg uh, grades. So you can have an anterior rim fracture or the posterior rim fractures. The anterior rim fractures, depending on the size of the fragment, you can either use a cannulated screws with, uh, with an open approach, or one can do an, either an open or an arthroscopic uh, repair using anchors if the fragment is small. If it's big, then one needs to make sure that the articular surface is well reduced to avoid any chance of um, uh, degeneration rapidly. The posterior approach, again, if it's a small one, one could potentially leave it, uh, but they then tend to have an increased risk of developing degenerative changes. The glenoid fractures depend uh, class into two, three, and four, uh, depending on where the fracture ends. And the treatment on these is based on the degree of displacement and the articular steps that one can see. And going on further, um, you can have a combination of uh, where the fracture line ends. But again, uh, this will depend, the management, especially if it's a surgical, will depend on the degree of articular step and angulation and displacement. Type six is a comminuted fracture. Um, and some, most of the times these are left alone to um, be treated. Uh, as fixation becomes very difficult in these. So just to guide us to how to assess and manage the glenoid fractures. So if it's less than five millimeter evulsion and if it's stable, then you go non-operative. If it's a rim or a fossa fracture, and depending on the size of the fragment, uh, one may decide to treat it operatively or non-operatively. If it's a comminuted fracture of the fossa, and if the head is located centrally, then don't need to do anything. If it's a combination of glenoid and scapular fracture, then based on either of them, whether it needs, uh, if the glenoid fracture needs surgery, then do the surgical treatment. If no, and does the scapular fracture require fixation? And I would suggest that if you're fixing one, it doesn't need to be that both of them have to be fixed. Um, but often you end up fixing both as this provides a better pain relief. Uh, we talk about the scapular suspensory systems complex. So you'll hear quite a lot um, is the SSC complex disruption. So what is this SSC? So it's a bony and soft tissue ring composed of the glenoid, the coracoid, the acromion, the distal clavicle, and the ligaments that um, attach to these. So it's the coracoclavicular ligament, the acromioclavicular ligament, and the CA ligament. 
And what the ring does, it maintains a stable relationship between the upper extremity and the axial skeleton. So unlike the lower limb, uh, where the hip and knee is connected through the pelvis, which is connected to the main axial skeleton, the scapula, as I said, at right at the beginning is indirectly connected via the clavicle. So the clavicle is the only bone that connects the whole of the upper limb to the rest of the axial skeleton. Generally, a single traumatic disruption uh, does not change the stability. And again, I would say that the injury to this um, SSC is like a pelvic ring fracture. So to disrupt on one side, there has to be another break. So it's like a polo mint. Uh, to crack the polo mint, it has to break at more than one place. And depending on the degree of displacement and the type of injury, so unlike the polo mint, uh, where it is all solid, uh, this um, ring has got soft tissue element to it. And the soft tissue element may heal up and as long as there is no significant displacement, one may not need to uh, do a surgical intervention. Where it changes is where there is double disruption um, and or failure of the ring in two places or more. Now, this may be a, either just bony or a combination of bony and a soft tissue disruption. So, for example, um, a single soft tissue disruption with clavicle fracture of body or spine or scapula, or a glenoid neck fracture with uh, either AC joint separation or a clavicle fracture. This generally tend to mean that the uh, ring has been disrupted in two places and you have got a floating shoulder. And this is likely to cause uh, significant morbidity uh, following this injury. So approaches to the scapula will depend on um, what injury you are trying to treat. Uh, we've discussed about the superior approach um, and the delta pectoral is, is pretty standard and out of the remit of this talk. So I'm not going to touch on that. It's mainly the posterior approach um, and traditionally, People have used the classic Jude approach, but more recently people, uh, because the Jude approach involves quite a lot of soft tissue dissection, people are moving away from that and using uh, less invasive approaches. <clears throat> so the classic Jude is done either in a lateral position or a prone position or a semi-prone position where the curved incision uh, starting from the posterolateral tip of the acromion extending along the medial spinal scapula and then at a right angle turning along the medial border of the scapula. Uh, following this, the infraspinatus is detached from the um, spine and dissected sharply of the medial border of the scapula. <clears throat> And the whole of the infraspinatus uh, is lifted off, leaving a cuff on the medial edge. And the rest of the infraspinatus is lifted like a flap um, over the uh, lateral insertion on the pedicle. And as you dissect more medially, uh, one needs to be aware of the suprascapular nerve that comes in the notch, as well as the circumflex uh, vessels on the inferior part. The modified incision is a straight incision starting from the postlateral tip of the acromion and then separate incision uh, as required. So this is what I was trying to say is when you lift up the whole of the infraspinatus, those neurovascular structures are at risk um, if one is not careful handling the pedicle of the infra and the supraspinatus more diagrammatic representation of the same. And you can see uh, once you lift it up, so that's why people are moving now towards using um, other incisions. Now there's various uh, approaches uh, that are described um, to access the scapula and the glenoid in the spine posteriorly, um, including one from Ibrahim, 
and the um, one by Jerosh and Obremsky, uh, the, which show that the scapula can be assessed through separate incisions. So just to show you the incisions, this is your classic uh, Jude approach. And what you can see is that one would need to peel off the part of the um, trapezius to begin with. And then the whole of the um, infraspinatus um, is lifted off. Alternatively, depending on what fractures you need to fix, you can have uh, separate small incisions. The one on the lateral border of the uh, scapula is becoming quite popular. Uh, as you can, you also don't need to cut any uh, muscles in this. You can split between the infra and the teres uh, to access the lateral border of the scapula. And if you need to go on the medial side, then you can use a combination of these uh, incisions. So this is an example of a patient who has got both the body and the uh, glenoid fracture with a large stem which would need fixation. This is some other views of the same injury. So to conclude, the take home messages uh, for this is that always look out for any associated injuries as about 80% of them will have some injury. Uh, rule out chest trauma and neurological insert, uh, insult. Have a high suspicion of um, an injury based on the mechanism of injury. And if on a plain radiograph, the scapula doesn't look or the glenoid doesn't look normal, then have low threshold to get a CT scan done. Avoid delay in the diagnosis and management, especially in polytrauma. And there are surgical indications, definite ones is displacement more than 30, angulation of the body more than 45 degrees, the glenopolar angulation of less than 20 degrees, uh, significant step in the joint of the in the uh, glenoid articular surface and displaced double disruption of the SSC. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sitesh. Thank you, Vijay, for that uh, fantastic presentation. A lot of case examples as well. Uh, a few questions, uh, Vijay. One is, uh, how do you approach these intra-articular glenoid fractures? For example, based on the location, suppose it's an inferiorly exiting fracture, you can take any of the modification of the jude, uh, which is going directly towards the glenoid. And what about the superior part, superior glenoid fractures? What is that? So, so you, can, you can use the modified jude, depending on which way the fragment is going, you can do that. And also you can use the delta pectoral, the lower part of the delta pectoral um, incision and just do release part of the subscapularis and that does provide access to the, um, uh, to the inferior part of the glenoid. The advantage as I see it with the uh, delta pectoral, if you can use, is certainly for me is the familiarity of the approach. So even as a shoulder surgeon, I don't have that much, um, you know, I don't do the posterior approach that regularly. So unless uh, I was sure that there was no other option uh, but to use that, I would um, go anteriorly. But if it's a glenoid neck, then yes, you have to go posteriorly. What about the superior glenoid? How, how do you approach this? Is it the classic today? Superior, the glenoid fractures is best approach either using a modified approach or the anterior approach. Because as I said, if you use the classic Jude, you have got to lift and you know, it's quite a big, I mean, it doesn't appear, but when you lift it up, the infraspinatus is quite a big uh, muscle. And what happens is as you try and lift it up, it almost bunches up and to try and to get into that corner, is quite tricky without having to worry about damage to the suprascapular <coughs> nerves and vessels and the um, circumflex. Thank you for that, Vijay. The other thing is regarding the scapular body fractures. Of course, there's a mm -hmm. lot of data that is coming about linear polar angle. The I mean, the uh, angle that is 45 degrees that you mentioned on the lateral view. 
extra articular fractures getting operated. Do you think that we are over aggressive regarding these body fractures? Because body fractures traditionally heal very well and approaching it surgically, do you think that the com complications are going to be significantly <clears> higher <throat> if you are not really trained to do those? Sure. I mean, I think that is whether you call it as a downside or advantage of uh, specialism. Okay, so as people become more and more specialists, the indications kind of tend to start to change. I mean, when I was training, you know, you hardly saw anybody talk about scapular fractures, leave alone uh, fix them. You know, they were always said, okay, he's got a scapular fracture. But I think having said that, it also means that we have a better understanding of these um, injuries. And equally, maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago, the patient expectation was quite different um, than what it is now. Um, so often you have to, uh, you know, some, you know, often I will do a fixation of any fracture in a bead clavicle or a distal radius, or for that example, a metacarpal fracture, uh, because the patient is keen and may have a reason for simple things that going back to work or less pain or being able to rehabilitate better. So, yeah, I mean, I think as long as the patient understands, um, I don't think we are in the era where um, it, it is necessary to go. And I mean, I always uh, talk about this paper, which actually were, is relevant very well. There was an um, editorial published by David Warwick and Ferris Sadat in the BJJ about the um, uh, rationality of um, non-operative treatment based on the fact that at six months or one year, the outcomes are the same. What they have said is that, you know, you, you're forgetting the middle path people or the were people who work um, who may not be able to take that, you know, have that six months into consideration. And often that has always been one of my big bugbears of uh, these, what they call as the pragmatic studies. So what the pragmatic study means is that if I, as a active working person with, a, let's say, for example, a clavicle fracture, if I decide that I cannot take time off for whatever the non-operative treatment, or I don't want to be part of it, then my data is not included. So the only per data that is presented is the people who are self-selecting, you know, to be part of that trial. And so I think that was, that's actually um, applies true to any uh, treatment modality that one may. I think that's the key word, right? Off late, the pragmatic trials. Even the proper yeah. trial, I don't know, it's a pragmatic trial, isn't it? Correct. So, uh, I mean, it has got some advantages, but you, you know, I, I would hate if people started to use that as a yardstick to measure everybody's, uh, to apply to everybody's treatment. There has to be a patient choice, you know. And I always say, you know, if I get a scaphoid fracture, if I get a clavicle fracture, I'll probably have it find a good surgeon and have it fixed. Thank you, Vijay, for that. The other question is, how do you approach a floating shoulder? Suppose you have a clavicle fracture and a glenoid neck fracture. Mm -hmm. What do you approach? So, I mean, I think looking at the patient as a whole, I mean, this is the one where, you know, the one that I described, this is the double disruption of the uh, suspensory system, SSC complex. And in this one, you would certainly start with fixing the clavicle fracture. And then the glenoid fracture neck would be based on its own merit. So if you just fix the um, uh, clavicle fracture, then it's likely that the glenoid will fall in, in place. I mean, if it's an intraarticular fracture or significant displacement, then yes, one may make uh, uh, an indication to do that. But certainly I would fix the glenoid. It's easier to fix and a simpler uh, rehabilitation as well. Uh, the reason I asked Vijay is that classically teaching is when you have a double disruption in the clavicle and the glenoid neck, that is a floating shoulder, you fix only the clavicle, right? And the glenoid comes back into position. And but awfully, there have been a couple of trials that looking at, okay, why don't you fix the clavicle as well as the glenoid? So that is a very, very complex surgery, isn't it? Yeah, I think that is one of the reasons, it as you rightly said, that that is one of the reasons why we don't um, fix the glenoid because approaching that um, makes 
it more complex. B, a simple surgery now then becomes complex, prolonged. And what must one must also remember is that any surgical dissection does make that rehab a bit longer. Um, so what by just fixing the glenoid one could make, uh, by just fixing the clavicle, you would make the patient much more easy to mobilize. If we try and do both, um, might delay things. Thanks, Vijay. I, just one last question before we conclude. Now, mm -hmm. Vijay, you have seen all kinds of scapular fractures. I mean, you have been into practice for years. I mean, I mean, I would say decades of orthopedic experience. You in Baroda, the UK. Have you yeah. seen uh, patients with scapulothoracic dissociation? So now, I mean, I have seen scapulothoracic dissociation uh, in in the early stages. I mean, look, if I go back how many years, nearly 28 years ago when I first started, those patients would not even make it to the department, yeah? Because what you're seeing with the scapulothoracic uh, dissociation is a serious injury and they probably got a vascular injury or other injuries and they don't make it to the hospital. Then we came to a stage where people started recognizing them um, and treating them now they're just taken straight to the major trauma centers because you know to just to get a scapulothoracic dissociation you have to have other injuries be it head injury or a spinal injury or they may be hemodynamically unstable so we don't see those in a, a level two unit where i work um, they're all taken to the trauma center okay thank you Vijay, for that i think that's all the questions that we have Vijay, uh, thank you for this fantastic session a lot of new learning points I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank, Thank you, you once again for joining in. Thank you, Tesh. You're kind. Thank you. Thank you very much.